welcome to the panel, Enablers of Web3 Gaming. Uh, so I'm really happy to have actually four people here um, to chat about the topic. Um, so just a quick intro, um, I'm HQ Han, I work at Protocol Labs, have been there for one and a half years, uh, and I drive Web3 growth, so driving Filecoin's adoption in Web3 use cases, so NFTs, games, and the metaverse. All right, so let's kick it off. Um, I'll let you guys do a quick round of intros. Okay. Um, keep it to like one, two minutes each. Um, you know, like share with us um, a bit of background about yourself, um, your current role, and you know, how your current role plays in into Web3 Gaming. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah, thank you, HQ. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Chase Rio. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OP Games. I've been in the game space, I'd say, for the last 13, 14 years now mostly in free-to-play mobile gaming and browser gaming. Um, prior to gaming, I was in traditional finance. Actually, I was living here and working in Singapore. Um, and then, you know, realized that, you know, there must be more to finance, and that's kind of like where I found gaming. Um, now, I've co-founded OP Games back in 2017 um, with two other co-founders. Uh, we were building tooling solutions for, for, for games, specifically NFTs and marketplace builders back then. Um, but obviously, like, it was way too early for that idea, and so we kind of like, moved on into um, hyper-casual and casual gaming and bringing and bridging them over into the Web3 space. So that's what I'm currently working on right now, um, and you know, happy to actually share all that I've learned so far over the last couple of years being in Web2 and in Web3 gaming. Hey, Vincent. Awesome. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Vincent Shen. I'm the uh, co-founder and uh, partner of uh, AC Capital. So as the name suggested, we are a crypto VC. Uh, um, and we started actually uh, first uh, back in 2018 as a, a crypto media in China. Um, then we started investing in all crypto projects um, uh, back in 2020. And uh, we have a specific kind of um, uh, interest in end user facing kind of um, uh, application projects. Uh, and uh, uh, more specifically, and we also have a very strong interest in gaming. Uh, over the last year, we invested in quite a few uh, GameFi projects and uh, uh, being a little bit, bit different from our uh, you know, uh, VC counterparts, we are actually very, very hands-on. So we get uh, deeply involved in the early stage of the uh, GameFi projects and uh, we uh, involved in their idealization uh, stage. We got involved in their uh, you know, like, uh, tokenomics design, uh, go-to-market strategy and also market-making strategy. So being invested in so many, uh, you know, GameFi and uh, also like uh, end user facing projects, we kind of like learn a lot about, um, you know, uh, pros and cons of uh, all kinds of, um, you know, um, project design. So this is something that I can really share with everyone here. Um, and yeah, so currently we are still, we, we have a very strong uh, conviction in this uh, perspective. So. Uh, this is still uh, our very big focus, uh, even in this market situation. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, everybody. My name is John. I work at Protocol Labs. I lead our NFTs and gaming efforts uh, when we think about how we can get people to use IPFS and Filecoin in different ways. Um, I've been at Protocol Labs for about three years. I've worn a bunch of different hats. I used to work on our proofs team. Uh, I actually was the first PM for NFT storage and Web3 storage, two of the on-ramps that we use to get a lot of people onto IPFS and Filecoin, and then moved over to the ecosystem side where I lead a lot of our growth efforts. Oh, that was fast, okay. Hi, I'm Stan Lee, uh, CEO and co-founder of Prominence Games. So a bit of background by myself is I've been in gaming for about 20 years. Majority spent playing, of course, because I'm quite young. Um, Prominence Games essentially is like a, I think an infrastructure gaming layer in uh, Web3 games where we are like an asset deployment platform primarily focused on play to earn in the early phases. I think that narrative has changed over the past one year, as we all know. And recently, up to date, we are actually building something a bit more targeted towards uh, gamers, more so uh, encapsulating not just like Web3 gaming essentially, but both for Web2 gamers and Web3. Uh, the main reason is because of the change in the ethos. I think in the past, it was Web3 game five being able to attract gamers into the space by the use of technology. But we soon realized that technology is not the enabler of the shift of the market. Because the truth is, the more complicated technology becomes, as a gamer and speaking from a gamer's perspective, because I share two hats, it becomes increasingly difficult for gamers to adopt. Because ultimately, adding more layers of technology also means adding more layers of complexity, right? not necessarily simplicity. 
and I think gamers just want a simple way to move it. So I think what we're trying to solve for and what we're trying to build now is to change the market perspective of things and also to create solutions for the market to enter Web3 without the whole nuances of like wallets and stuff like that, or solve for that at least. So yeah, Stanley here. All right, thank you all. Um, let's dive right in. So the topic for today is enablers of Web3 gaming, uh, infra, guilds, capital, and more, and a lot of experience here on the stage. Um, so I want to dive into infrastructure first, right? Um, and maybe, you know, JV, John, uh, John <laughs> and Chase, right? Um, and maybe Stanley as well, or any of you. Um, so help us understand, right? Like, what's the infrastructure that's required for Web3 Gaming? Maybe give us, like, a, a mental model, right? Why is infrastructure significant? You know, um, and then, you know, Chase, you can always go into, like, how it has evolved in the space, you know, in your whole, like, 15 years in this whole, like, gaming space. So I'll let JV kick it off. You know, provide like mental model, how you think about infrastructure for Web3 gaming, and then Chase can follow on, yeah. Sure. So I think there's like a couple layers that you can think about things. And when we say Web3 gaming, I think there's an important question of what do we actually mean by Web3 gaming? I think there's like games that incorporate aspects of Web3. There's like Web3 things that try to gamify, as <laughs> Stanley has a great one-liner on. But I think like when I think about it, I think at the very minimum, it's incorporating some of the primitives that we see inside of the decentralized space uh, into games that already sort of exist. So like the canonical example we might see is something like an NFT, where there's some object that you can use inside of a game, but you can also bring that object outside. Other people can implement environments, spaces, other games that use those same, reuse the same assets. Um, I think when you start thinking in this like cross-platform way, uh, you start running into really interesting questions, which typically are not things that game developers may think about. Um, so especially with an NFT, like what is the resilience of that asset and how do you make sure we're not coupled to one developer making that asset available or even in one environment? So if you create an asset through Unreal Engine, what does it mean for that to be like usable in Unity as well? Um, so I think we've seen a lot of really interesting tooling that's starting to be developed. I think like when we think at the very base level of static assets, people using IPFS and Filecoin as ways that you can sort of store, serve, have that sort of like uncoupling of the data layer from the application layer, where you can get the persistence, the availability, the distribution of that content in a decentralized way. Um, but when you start thinking about the functionality, how do you do like much more granular things like the translation between game engines? That requires specialized tooling and teams are springing up that are sort of seeing that in this new space where we're thinking about interoperability, we need some of those primitives to exist. Um, so I think that's like one area that we're seeing some really interesting innovation go on with infrastructure on the gaming side. Um, I think the other side though that's kind of fascinating is people looking at sort of like the Web3 primitives and how they can just help gaming agnostic of anything like NFTs or like tokens, just how can we make gaming more efficient? Um, so there's some really cool stuff, especially with how game engines lay out their assets. Um, where you can use things like content addressing and the different formats that we have to take advantage of Unreal Engine's like dynamic loading of assets so you can reduce the footprint of a game on a device. And I think this is actually sort of like the pincer attack where it's like how do we create and like bring in Web3 technologies not for the sake of just like, oh look, there's this thing that might speculatively get higher in value. How do we bring things that actually offer like value props directly to users? And so I think even in that category of what is Web3 gaming, maybe we might expand that definition to say, like, what are games that will use Web3 technologies, whether that's directly building, like, monetization or cross-platform assets, but also including things like games that just have the superpowers of Web3 under the hood in whatever mm -hmm. format that might be. Yeah, I guess, like, I want to follow up on that one. I think that, um, you know, the question is fairly nuanced. Um, you know, with my experience coming in from Web2 to Web3, a couple of years ago, I think a big chunk, or at the very least three things that we kind of like have to look for in terms of like how we can move over Web2 game developers into doing Web3 games is number one, we have to actually think about infrastructure, just like what JV mentioned. Um, on top of infrastructure, we have to think of um, distribution channels and also kind of like a pivot um, into like what, what economic models. Um, would benefit game developers who's used to the free-to-play concept, who's used to box games shipping over via Steam, because at the end of the day, how we actually pivot over game developers really depends on how seamless the technology is um, and you know, how the model itself 
works for game developers. So let's say, for example, with, with um, game engines at the moment on the infrastructure side of things, um, it's kind of like really interconnected with how it's distributed as well. So like if you look at Godot or um, you look at uh, Phaser, for example, these are like HTML5 game engines that a lot of independent game developers are using. Um, it's, it's actually a, a, a market that kind of like needs to discover Web3 because right now, independent game developers are, are on the shorter end of the stick in terms of like how they monetize their games. A lot of times they make a small HTML5 game, um, you know, kind of like low poly game, but at the end of the day, the distribution for that is usually difficult because it has to go on Steam, it has to go to itch.io, but there's just not a lot of people paying for the game itself. And so you look at game developers, you think, all right, how do I accommodate them in their movement into the Web3 space? And it starts with you know, the technology and the game engine, understanding exactly how Web3 comes in, in terms of, in terms of changing that narrative of selling in-game assets, for example, in a purchase versus selling NFTs. Um, you know, with, with centralized games, we can see them as, you know, creating assets all the time and selling it to their users. But with, with, with Web3 games, for example, we talk about selling limited number of assets via NFTs. And the way they make money as a developer is through secondary markets, through primary sales. But it takes time as opposed to the current model right now where they just create an asset and they sell it to the audience or to the players and the players buy it. So a big, a big shift in, 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 in mindset should happen, but at the same time, um, being able to provide a right mix of technology, um, the right mix of distribution channel, because right now, even though Apple opened up um, NFTs in, in their ecosystem, that's still 30% of you know, what, what, what Apple will take versus the 70% that developers would take. It's still exorbitant, right? Um, and so like a proper distribution channel that empowers more Web3 games. And quite lastly, um, I would say um, a more sustainable model of how we can actually incorporate some Web2 elements into um, you know, a Web3 game. So I would say right now we're moving into like a Web 2.5 kind of like way of developing games, wherein there's still this um, decentralized elements of NFTs, crypto, um, but at the same time, there's still centralized assets being utilized in the game because that's still the driver of fun um, in the game itself versus the speculative assets that you know, they can go ahead and also accommodate um, so that they could go ahead and have the best of both worlds. All right, yeah. Okay, um, let's switch to talking about guilds. Um, and I'm gonna direct that question to Stanley, mostly. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think, um, and he'll tell his story in a bit, right? Started with a guild, but you're moving and changing your business model. Um, some of the things that you said in the intro. So, um, so guilds, you know, like something that exists in Web2 already. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that you're like a guild master. He's actually a guild master uh, in his past life of one of the largest guilds of Guild War 2. So a really experienced gamer here, right? And can really provide perspective. So um, let's start with like explaining to the audience, right? Like how Web3 gaming guilds actually differ from Web2. Um, and you know, like how have you seen the growth and evolution of guilds in this space? You know, like business model, like the way they are approaching players and enabling games as well. Yeah. I think it's a... Uh... Oh. Good question to ask because I think the term guild was not coined from I think it's not. Is it? Mm, I think. Is it okay? Hello? Hello? Yeah, maybe talk a bit more. Hello, hello? Oh, no, yeah. It's better be a microphone somewhere. I'll just hold the mic. Right. <laughs> maybe try? Uh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so I think the term guild was not coined. In to be um, it's a term that exists. It's a term that existed since. Uh, Let me pass you this this microphone. Is it better? Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank Hello. You. 
Okay, yes, special treatment. Right. <laughs> yeah, so I was saying, I think it existed even in Web 2 games. Uh, in Guild Wars 2, literally the term, the game itself has the term Guild, right? And it came from a very different ideology back then. For Guilds to exist, I think the majority of the community is built literally on gaming itself. Everyone came for a similar purpose. The only reason why I was Guildmaster because I think my peers were too lazy to take on additional responsibility, right? And it was a free responsibility. I was not paid for that, to be fair. Um, in the past, all of us were very incentivized to hop online, okay? Not by financial gain, not by financial means, but just for the pure pleasure of having each other's camaraderie and like comrades. And this actually transcended to something very interesting. So in Web3, guilds are a bit more than that. Guilds are more like a semi-business structured organization now, whereby there are people on the top layer who is funding the guild activities because it's not uh, the same anymore, right? I think in Web3 games, one of the primary differences is that a lot of them have an entry fee, right? And large guilds at mass cost money because most of the participants when I was in was from X Infinity, where the assets were not uh, easily afforded by the average player, uh, especially in developing countries, where it was more primitive back then. So the transcendence came about um, in, into XE. That actually changed how guilds function, is, essentially. So speaking further on that is, you start to see models whereby there are trainers, there are players, there's owners, and there were different entities within the guild itself. And over time, right, I think people formalized this model. There were a lot of infrastructure literally built for it. Guild management systems that didn't exist before in traditional guilds. Yes. I think monetization models came out of it as well. Management fees came about, uh, splitting of fees, all this financial talk, right? Now, guilds that ran on that model thrived back then. So in last year, if you were running a guild in March all the way to this year, maybe January, or even December last year, I think you have a pretty solid model. And back then, when Play Donor was a big thing, when all the news were all positive about it, of course, there were some skeptics, etc. The model worked. Okay, the model worked. The entire industry built around it, and guilds became one of the biggest selling models at the point in time. But shortly after, as we all are experiencing now in this bull market, oh, sorry, bear market, right? I think GameFi also suffered from it because with the lack of liquidity and exposure of GameFi, XE, and the you know, willingness to part with money to experiment on a different new module, of course, the nature of XE's economy caused the token itself right, to decrease in value simply because there was too much churn of it. Now, when there's too much churn of it and no one literally snapping up the tokens buying or whichever recrafting of the model there is, the economy will definitely shift downwards because the people who entered this industry, the guilds that entered the industry for like financial gains, have less incentive now, right? And so most of us will pivot naturally. Even myself, right? We will pivot into something that's more sustainable. If you know that building a play -to -earn, pure play-to-earn model is not sustainable, we build towards different things, be it marketing, like what uh, Vincent might share later. Uh, whether it's marketing, whether it's building more seamless experiences, I think generally everyone bends together and realize like, you know, we are a very small market. Our total wallet collection only represents like 7% of the population in the world. And in fact, most of us have multiple wallets, so that's not even a true representative. How do we come together, rather than by financial gain, interest the external public, the other 93%, to enter this space? Whether it's marketing, whether it's building seamless solutions, no matter what it is, I think most of the guilds have pivoted to that. I, I know one of the interesting guilds also that pivoted to a social app. Literally a Tinder, but for gamers. So this one, I'll let you discover on your own. But for now, I think guilds is a narrative of the past. The guilds that remain will eventually fall back to the guild model of the Web2, right? where people just band together, play as a community, experience new games together. Whether it's making money, whether it's about spending money, I think the original narrative is starting to fall back into place and guilds that are still business-oriented are now shifting into you know, finding different business models. So that's my take. Yeah, okay. So we covered infrastructure and Stanley shared about guilds and their evolution. Um, you know, let's talk a bit about like capital um, incubation and, and acceleration here, right? Very important parts of the ecosystem. 
Um, so maybe Vincent and, and, and Chase, you know, like, um, you know, from, from GM Friends as well, your experience. Yeah. Um, but maybe start with Vincent. Um, so AC Capital has invested very heavily into games, GameFi, and social components in Web3. Um, how do you see the role of capital um, in the Web3 gaming space, right? And maybe share with us uh, when you're looking at a project, right? What are the key things that you're looking out for? For sure. Um, so first thing, I would like to share some um, <laughs> reality about the, uh, the capital's opinions in the um, gaming sector or like Web3 gaming or GameFi uh, at this moment. So the, tr the truth is um, actually a lot of um, um, VCs, even us, uh, we are kind of like slowing down our investment into um, 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 GameFi, but uh, really um, um, notice that uh, we use the, the term GameFi is that uh, we kind of like to stop investing in the uh, crypto gaming uh, projects which are still using the previous kind of like a play to earn model, uh, which is pretty much like a proven not to be working. Um, so we are still looking for the um, next and kind of like a new paradigm in um, gaming. Um, so why does the previous kind of, a, you know, like a crypto gaming uh, model not working so well? Um, so one of the reasons is that um, if you see gaming as one like a black box, like um, any kind of like gaming projects, they are trying to attract their traffic, right? Attract the new players or uh, new project participants, depends on, depending on like a, what kind of a motivation they actually have to really attract the participants to, into the game. But regardless of which one, game itself is like a black box. Um, it's really, really hard for uh, the outsiders to have uh, to peel to really see what's inside. So when users are actually attracted into the game, it's very hard for uh, much information to be disseminated to the exter uh, external world and for the new out like outsiders or to kind of like uh, join the game as a newbies. So game itself is really not very promotable. For, for many of the crypto uh, gaming projects. And uh, just to have a look at you know, how small the crypto gaming sector is compared to the entire you know, gaming industry or com even compared to um, in the crypto world, how small is the, the gaming part. Uh, check out um, you know, CoinMarketCap for uh, you know, gaming tokens and see how is their, um, their rankings. Or basically check out how many uh, developers are actually working on uh, crypto gaming compared to the developers uh, working in the gaming industry in general. So I would say this sector is still very, very early, but I would say being early is not an excuse. It's actually something that you need to work on, right? So you need to think about how can you really improve your um, onboarding of new users? How can you actually channel them in to uh, in, into your uh, game world, right? See if there's any like a, uh, major obstacles along their user's journey where say like, oh, they uh, uh, meet the problems when they trying to, you know, create a wallet or, you know, the uh, user experience just uh, not so smooth or basically they simply just not interested in the way that you're structuring your, your game, right? Because Web3 audience are simply just not the same as the Web2 uh, gaming audience. They are not pure players. Um, funny, <laughs> very funny to say is that, uh, you know, Web2, uh, Web3 audience, they all have some level of, you know, speculation uh, tendency. Um, so you cannot really treat a uh, Web3 uh, audience as typical kind of like uh, Web2 gamers. You need to really find a way to engage them, uh, not just the with the playability, the fun of a gameplay. But you also need to think about, okay, so if you have NFT, if you have the tokens, how can you really make your community happy when they enjoy the fun? They, it also makes, you know, like economic sense to them to really, um, you know, like engage them in your game for the long run. Um, so I would say when I look at um, a um, gaming team to make a, a um, investment decision, I would first, first uh, look into um, 
the team's kind of like understanding of their target market, right? Who are their target audience? What is, uh, what, what, what do your like target market really like? The second thing is about the kind of like team's kind of experience in making the games. Um, many of the, the, the game teams failed because they are actually, you know, like from a pure kind of like blockchain background. It's actually the games made by uh, blockchain devs, right? Um, gaming is actually a very, very specific thing, right? Gaming industry has been around for over 30 years already, even, even 40 years. If that's the case, you cannot just uh, compete with the traditional, uh, you know, gaming dev in terms of like making, making a game, in terms of like a, a fun or the playability things. Uh, let the, the uh, experts to do the, uh, the, uh, the, the professional stuff, right? And leave the... Um, uh, blockchain part to the, the blockchain dev. So this is also something uh, we look into it. And finally is that uh, we are looking into um, the uh, idea of um, go-to-market strategy. How you can disseminate the information to uh, the general public about your stuff. How you can really attract them. Again, this is also about like the onboarding thing, but it's more about the specific plan. So another thing, another trend that we noticed recently, uh, uh, especially you know after the hit, the, the the wave of uh, step in or move to earn games, is that uh, you can generalize it into a uh, gamified kind of uh, social behaviors. So social itself is already about engaging the mass, engaging the general public, and uh, giving them the gamification kind of experience uh, is a way that to bring them the fun and. Uh, basically to engage them for the long run. And if you can really do the tokenomics uh, or basically the you know, profits and distribution model right, then it is something, uh, um, you know, like a worth uh, <laughs> speculating on um, as a, like a, one of the like a new paradigm. Um, so that's our two cents, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, we're actually in the last few minutes of the panel, so maybe we just like wrap it up with like one final question to all, all four of you, you know, like maybe give us like one line about what are you hopeful for, for the Web3 gaming space? I think uh, for me, what I'm hopeful for, for the Web3 gaming space, um, a lot of people are th talking about mass adoption and the only way we can actually achieve that is to make sure that we not only cater to the Web3 space, but also to developers and builders on the Web2 space as well. And a big chunk of like what, how we should work on that one. For me, I'm a firm believer of open sourcing. So making sure that we have composable technologies that can be built on top of each other. So that, because um, like this is what we've seen in terms of the success of like a lot of Web2 games as well. And so I think that, um, you know, with the, t with, 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 the, with the ethos of Web3, um, open sourcing is something that we should all mm -hmm. be doing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm hopeful, hopeful for for developers in the Web3 space. Um, and um, you know, hopefully we have more builders coming in in the next couple of months. Yeah, so um, um, my comment on this is um, always know your target audience first to uh, understand what they actually want, to understand uh, what actually motivates them. Then, um, ta uh, and then in, in, like respectively uh, design your product. Uh, don't actually, you know, like uh, um, just uh, just uh, you know like uh, come like think about your your uh, product design from your own imagination. This is not going to work. Uh, and also like uh, try to think out of the box, not stick with the uh, status quo in the you know gamify or existing crypto gaming uh, products. Right. The new uh, the the new trending thing is going to coming from the ash of uh, the the old. Uh, proven to be not working kind of stuff, and this is something you really need to be creative about. I guess uh, sort of to build off of that, I think one of the things I'm super excited about is the fact that we are in a bear market means a lot of the things that worked in a bull market worked that were like really frothy are not going to make sense right now. And so I think, uh, especially when we think about what are the superpowers Web3 sort of gives us, and how do we do it in ways that are actually sustainable, when you sort of are fighting against a bear market, I think you have to lean much more on like fundamentals and things like what are the real reasons that people want to like play games and how can we use like the superpowers of Web3 in a much more complementary way. And so even when that comes to like using the different monetization mechanisms that exist in Web3, I do think there are ways in which 
the Web2 monetization mechanisms. I don't think anyone's going to argue that microtransactions are fun or a thing that people enjoy. So like, we have alternatives, and now there's more design space that people will pursue because what seemed to be working is not working anymore. And like, yeah, now the time is to iterate. So. I would like to think of uh, Web3, if I can sum it up, is remember the reason or the ethos of what you're building for. Like, if you are building a game, focus on the game, right? If you build something that is based on intrinsic value that people would pay for, rather than extrinsic value that people come to extract, for example, financial gains, I think there's a longer term purity that you can search for. A good example that Vincent mentioned is Steppen. Steppen compared to another competitor company, I would say, is Sweatcoin. When your front page on Sweatcoin is filled with things like National Health UK um, and more of uh, the stuff that they believe in, right? They believe in, you know, when you exercise, when you do certain things, you can reward, be rewarded for it. And I mean, these rewards are more minute, of course. But I think the ethos in which they build in is very clearly depicted on all of their branding, their creatives. I think even their light paper and stuff like that. Building like this in the long term is more sustainable because if there is intrinsic value that people are willing to pay for, that also means more money is being poured into the system rather than being taken away, right? And if you want to lead into a sustainable future, I think that's what we all need to work together towards to, is to build back the purity or the ethos of what you came to build for your company for past the financial returns. So that's what I like to end with. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, we covered a lot today. Uh, and the space is very new, um, you know, but there are so many components of the ecosystem and the stack that needs to be built. So, yeah, definitely food for thought. Um, thank you to all four of our panelists. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.